this section of notes, we're going to look at more of the modern day uh, impacts of industrialization as well as how industrialization is changing from a secondary industry to more of a tertiary industry and how that's affecting the world as a whole. First thing I want to look at is contemporary patterns and impacts of industrialization and development. One of the main key terms in this is space-time compression. This describes the reduction in the time it takes to diffuse or spread something to a distant place as a result of improved communications and transportation systems. And like that picture there in the top left corner of your video, um, you could see how far people are willing to travel. Now, with technology, what that's going to do is that's going to change this bubble, and that's going to make people be more willing to travel more distances because it doesn't take as much time with these improved things. That's referring to space-time compression. Both surface and ocean transportation has to be taken into account for getting raw materials to the factory, as well as electricity, water, and telephones. This way to get these materials to the factory, as well as electricity, water, and telephones, is referring to infrastructure. And that's what my picture in the top left corner is referring to, kind of showing you the basic infrastructure. If a place doesn't have very good infrastructure, they're not going to be industrialized. Now, moving on to our major industrial regions. We're going to focus on the primary industrial regions. These are the areas of the largest agglomeration of industry. And there's four major areas of industrial regions. The first is Western and Central Europe. The second that we're going to look at is Eastern North America. Then we're going to move on to Russia and Ukraine. And last but not least, we're going to look at Eastern Asia. Now, you can see here, if I can get my drawings out of the way, you can see this industrial belt throughout the world. And in this belt is where most of the world's industry um, takes place. The first region that I want to look at with you is Western and Central Europe. European industry recovered and expanded rapidly in the post-World War years. One thing that they, as well as a lot of these other nations, really all of these industrial regions, at one time focused on heavy industry. Heavy industry is wartime goods, and this was especially uh, this especially prospered in Russia and Germany, or the USSR more specifically. Even with colonial empires dwindling during the 1950s and the 1960s, the political and economic influence of Western and Central Europe kept it as an industrial power. And you could see with this picture at the top, there are a lot of industrial centers in this region that make it very, very important towards industrialization. Now looking at North America, World War I and World War II weakened Europe's economy, allowing the United States to emerge as an industrial power. The North American manufacturing belt extends from the northeastern edge around Boston and New York, south through Philadelphia and Baltimore. It then expands westward through upstate New York and Pennsylvania through the Great Lakes region. And I'll do my best to show you that on the map, but essentially, that is this region right through there. That's the United States' main industrial belt. But you also have a southeastern region or district. You could see that here. There's also a southwestern district, and then Southern California in the northwest. But mainly, your main industrial belt of North America uh, is in the northeastern region, and that especially developed after World War I and II. Now we're going to look at Russia and the other former Soviet republics. The USSR, because of its raw materials, made this region very, very important and a very influential industrial center. The Volga River has greatly influenced industrial output. It has provided hydroelectric power, and this hydroelectricity produced here is produced more than anywhere else in the world, and that fuels this industrial region. And then you throw into the mix that Trans-Siberian Railroad, which is um, this gray line throughout the map. 
This connected Siberia with western Russia and allowed for all the abundance of natural resources in the east to get their way towards the west. Really, this western region is your most important industrial center. Um, and you can also throw Ukraine in there as well. But you also have some other industrial centers which are pointed out on this map here. And then moving on to Eastern Asia. Japan fits as a country in Eastern Asia that also industrialized. Um, and it was the first country in Eastern Asia to actually industrialize. Economic development began during the second half of the 19th century with the Meiji Restoration. This was a remarkable government-sponsored campaign for modernization and colonization. And this Meiji Restoration uh, really improved industrialization in the region, in Japan. Japan's dominant region of industrialization is known as the Kento Plain. It's not on this map. I'll go ahead and draw Japan for you. Beautiful. Um, the Kanto Plain, which includes Tokyo and other nearby cities, formed a huge metro metropolis, uh, which is a major industrial center. Then you also have the four Asian tigers, which aren't on this map, but that was in one of the other sections and notes. Uh, that was South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Singapore. They used the strategy of export-oriented industrialization to directly integrate their economies into the global economy, by producing something international powers need, especially electronics. And then you have China with this picture here. China's been a political power for a very long time, but it wasn't an industrial power until the mid-20th centuries under communist leaders. Its earliest industrial heartland was the northeastern district in Manchuria. It centered on the region's coal and iron deposit. In recent years, the Pacific Rim, which is just countries that border the Pacific o Ocean on their eastern shores, the Pacific Rim has experienced industrialization rapidly. More and more cities of China are industrializing, partly through government-designated areas called special economic zones, and in these zones, foreign investment is allowed and capitalist ventures are encouraged. So basically, in these zones, China is saying... You're not communist here, you're capitalist so that you can become industrialized because without you, we wouldn't be an industrial power. Now moving on to secondary industrial regions. These developed later and their industrial centers are not as large, but their economies are growing. They lie south of the world's primary uh, e economies, uh, the primary industrial areas. And this is southeastern Asia, northern Africa, and then Latin America. Those are your secondary industrial regions, not to be confused with secondary economic activities. First area I want to look at is Latin America and Mexico with the Maquiladora. The Maquiladora are districts that produce goods primarily for consumers in the United States, and a number of United States companies have established plants in the zone to transform imported, duty-free components of raw materials into finished industrial products. And you can locate the large Maquiladora zones on this map, and they are right next to the border with the United States. This manufacturing zone in Mexico benefited greatly from NAFTA. Because of its location on the Mexico-United States border, it points to the fact that NAFTA is the reason that it's here. Another industrialization that's occurring is tertiary sec economic activities um, in India. Recent government policies have expanded industrialization in India. Because of large coal and iron ore deposits, in addition to hydroelectric power, India has a huge labor force, and it's geographically located between Europe and the Pacific Rim. And recently there's a trend for Indian speakers, or India, for speakers in India who speak English so that they can work in call centers, but also they have a electronic production plants. And then last but not least, I want to look at global inequalities. First, I want to look at the challenges for more developed countries. An important challenge for more developed regions is the protection of their markets from new competitors, with competition now occurring more and more frequently um, than ever before. And these are occurring more than ever in regional trading blocks, 
also, con, also known as conglomerates of trade among countries within a region. And you can see those trading blocks on this map here. The three most important trading blocks are North America with NAFTA, Europe with the European Union, and East Asia uh, with the Asian trading block. Most cooperation and co competition within and among trading blocks takes place through transnational corporations or companies that operate factories in countries other than the ones in which they are headquartered. The reason that this competition is growing is because labor in other countries is a lot cheaper and so they, they can make the product cheaper and sell it for cheaper and that just improves competition. Most transnational corporations are also conglomerate corporations, comprised of many smaller firms that support the overall industry. An example of a conglomerate corporation is General Motors. They actually consist of smaller firms that support the overall industry. Now I want to look at deindustrialization. During the past few decades, employment in manufacturing uh, as a share of total employment has fallen dramatically in the more developed countries because people don't want jobs in the primary economic activities anymore because they don't pay as well, they don't have the best working conditions, so they want more of the secondary and the tertiary. Now, the challenges for less developed countries because of industrialization. Distance from markets are big challenges because wealthy consumers are sometimes too far away. Also, the less developed countries have inadequate infrastructure and they support structure that will build infrastructure. And finally, competition with existing manufacturing in other countries is huge. And this heavily plays on less developed countries because they're just starting out and they're having to compete with places and industries that have been very successful for many years.